very excited about our next guest and speaker. Just had the opportunity to meet her the other day. Um, and we're really looking forward to the ways that we're gonna be able to work together with Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Um, before I introduce her, I just wanna thank Danielle for being her awesome staffer that we've been working with, and also nice to meet you, Allison, as well. And, um, and her office has been great because uh, we had to sneak her in here at the last minute and uh, make the timing all work, and everything is going great. So I'm just gonna introduce her and hand it over because she has to catch a plane. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal represents Washington's 7th District, which encompasses most of Seattle and the surrounding areas. Jayapal was elected to the Washington State Senate in 2014, becoming the first South Asian American ever elected to the state legislature and the only woman of color in the Washington State Senate. As a Washington State Senator serving in a Republican majority state, Jayapal fought for gender equality, expanded access, to contraceptives for all women, including those on Medicaid, and introduced legislation to increase the statewide minimum wage and provide free community college. She stood up to members of her own party against giveaways to predatory payday lenders and secured $5.2 million into transportation pre-apprenticeship programs for women and people of color. Congresswoman Jayapal is committed to ensuring economic opportunity, fairness and equity, and safe and healthy communities. She is proud of her district's role in Seattle and leading the country on issues like minimum wage, racial equality and innovation, and she works to support that work and lift it up as a model for the rest of the country. Her focus in Congress is on ensuring income equality, access to education, from early learning to higher education, including debt-free college, expanding social security and Medicare, protecting our environment for our next generations, and ensuring immigrant, civil, and human rights for all. Jayapal relentlessly challenges systems that corrupt our democracy, pushing for campaign finance reform, tax reform, voting rights, and an end to institutionalized racism. In all of these endeavors, she continues to build the movement to expand our democracy and create the political space for policy change that benefits everyday Americans. She's the first Indian American woman in the House of Representatives. Jayapal has spent the last 20 years working internationally and domestically as a leading national advocate for women's, immigrant, civil, and human rights. She came to the United States by herself at the age of 16 to attend college at Georgetown University and later received her MBA from Northwestern University. She was born in Chennai, India, and her parents still reside in India. She lives in Seattle with her husband and is the proud mother of a son and a stepson and a 65 pound Labradoodle. And I tell you all of that because I'm very excited that this woman is really one of us and it's so amazing and awesome that she's in Congress and that we're working with her and thank you so much for being here. Thank you all so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Caitlin. And I want to thank you and George, and I don't know if there are other founders here, but thank you for your leadership, for your vision. I know what it takes to start an organization because I've done it myself. And I know what it takes to challenge systems, and that's what you all have been doing. So my deep gratitude to you. Um, I also want to say, are there Washington State folks in the room? I know Norm Conrad. Is, there you are. Okay, I want to say thank you to you because we are so proud of our move to amend chapter in Washington State. And I remember when right after um, the initiative passed, I think I came and spoke to a gathering that you all had. And I can't remember what the number of volunteers were that you had, but it was phenomenal. And that is really, truly one of the best citizen organized campaigns I've ever seen. So congratulations to you and I'm thrilled to, thrilled to represent um, Seattle and also Washington State. Um, and you know, I'm just really happy to be here because this is a group of people that are true organizers and that are trying to do things from the bottom up. And you heard a little bit about my background. I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, I did want to say that I'm also the vice chair of the Democracy Reform Task Force. Um, I'm also the first vice chair. I ran, was elected as the first vice chair of the Progressive Caucus, which we like to say is the largest values-based caucus in the House. And people say, what does that mean? Um, and it basically means that even when you have Democrats, they're divided, right? There's more progressive Democrats, there's more conservative Democrats. So those are called values-based caucuses. There's the progressive caucus, there's the 
New Dems, and there's the Blue Dogs. And the Progressives have 78 members in the House of Representatives. And that is really quite remarkable. And let me tell you, when we win in November, we will have even more Progressives, and we will be the majority bloc. And so I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my background. Caitlin mentioned a little bit about it, but I think it's important to the kind of elected official that I am and the kind of work that I try to do and the kind of work that I think is relevant to what you do. I was born in India and I came to the United States when I was 16 years old by myself. My parents had about $5,000 in their bank account. They used all of it to send me here by myself because they felt like this was the place I was gonna get the best education and have the most opportunity. I applied to two universities. Believe it or not, one was Trinity, because my parents were very excited that it was an all women's college. And the other was Georgetown University. And so I ended up going to Georgetown University. And um, you know, I, I don't think I ever understood the extent of my parents' sacrifice uh, until my son turned 16. He's 21 now. But I thought about what that meant to send your kid across the ocean and know that they might never come back. Um, and so I take everything I do here very, very seriously. It took me 17 years to become a US citizen. And by the time I did, my parents were just too old to be able to bring them here. So they live in India now and I live here. And I feel like everything I do has to be to honor that sacrifice that they made. But when you are an Indian parent, and I actually think this is true of some other cultures as well, <coughs> and you take all your money and you send your kid to the United States for an education, there are only three professions that you are allowed to be. I'm sure you know what they are. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, there you go. See, everybody always gets it, so clearly this is a thing. And so I can tell you that it was absolutely not in my parents' design for me to be an elected official. It was certainly not in my parents' design for me to be an activist, somebody who has been arrested three times for civil disobedience actions in the streets. And I don't actually think it was in my design. Um, you know, I bought a t-shirt recently that says, all who wander are not lost. And that's because my path has not been linear, but I feel like everything that I have done has prepared me for this place that I play, that I take in Congress today. And it really was as an activist. I worked all over the world in international public health for 10 years, um, and then 9-11 happened, and we were just talking with Caitlin and George about the beginning of Move to Amend, and I really felt like I was being transported back, because I didn't think I was starting an organization after 9-11 when I took on initially what were hate crimes against Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians post 9-11 very quickly within two weeks turned into taking on the Bush administration around the detention and deportation and civil rights and civil liberties abuses that were happening across the country. We filed a nationwide class action lawsuit on behalf of 5,000 Muslim Americans across the country and we won and we stopped their deportation. Um, things that people never said were possible, right? But in those early days, we were like, what are we doing? Did we, did we just form an organization? You know, it was people sitting around a kitchen table. You all were in a living room somewhere. Um, and then recognizing that the urgency of the moment that creates that opportunity is actually the greatest soil and the greatest fertilizer for some of the best movements in the world. You don't always plan when that moment is gonna be but you do recognize when there is a moment and you take that moment. And so that work was what started the organization in Washington State. It's called One America. It was called Hate Free Zone originally. It's called One America now. I grew it. I was the executive director for 12 years. I grew it to be the largest immigrant advocacy organization in Washington State, one of the largest in the country. Um, and in the process of that, what I found is, you know, I like to say as an immigrant woman of color, uh, 
I don't have the luxury of siloing issues and picking one. It's not like I'm a mom on Monday, a woman on Tuesday, an immigrant on Wednesday, and a worker on Thursday. I'm actually all of those things all of the time. And so we found that we had to build these coalitions because not everybody cared about immigrant rights. Not everybody saw the connections. And in the process of that, recognizing that the folks that we were working with cared about minimum wage, cared about democracy reform, cared about getting money out of politics, cared about voting rights, cared about incarceration, cared about, ch uh, cared about uh, child care and paid safe and sick days. And so we started working on all of those issues and really broadening the way in which we think about what it takes for people to thrive what it takes for people to have a healthy democracy that supports the rights of everybody, what it takes to really organize that and to build our power. And one of the things we realized very quickly is be, in, in politics, you all will appreciate this because of your mission, in politics it felt like there were two things that could make a difference. One, unfortunately, was money, which we didn't have. And the other was votes. And so, when we realized we didn't have enough votes for people to pay attention to us, I ended up leading the largest voter registration drive in the history of our state. We registered 23,000 new folks to vote, and guess what? All of a sudden, it started to make a difference. And so I never thought I would run for office, but I got tired of trying to get elected officials to do the things that we felt really needed to happen. I felt there needed to be more women, there needed to be more folks of color, there needed to be more people that really represented our democracy. And so in 2014, I decided to run for the state senate, um, and I did, as Caitlin said, become the only woman of color in the state senate, the first South Asian American ever elected, but most of all, thinking about my theory of change, which is this. I didn't run for office because I wanted to be an elected official. Some people that I mentor come to me and they say, I wanna, I wanna run for office, I wanna be a Congress member. And my advice is always, don't think about what you wanna be, think about what you wanna do. So here's my theory of change. It is that we can use public office in a different way than it has been used before. And that actually, we organizers have ceded the territory of elected office. We have ceded it as organizers. We've said, no, we're too pure. We don't want to run for elected office. We're not going to do that. We're going to let other people run. We're going to be on the outside. We're going to say what we want, and then we're going to fight for it from the outside. But guess what? Elected office is an organizing platform, just like anything else is. And when I was at One America and we organized, we got hundreds of thousands of people engaged. Our membership was across the state, across the country, and it was through that power that we were able to make something happen. That is what you all have done by creating chapters across the country, by bringing people together and saying that we have more power when we can build that coalition more broadly, when we can get more cities involved, that is actually what happens. Well, you can do that in elected office too. If you get into elected office and you think that the only thing that you're supposed to do is pass legislation, then really, anytime you're in the minority, you're just wasting your time because I'm in the minority, actually I've been in the minority my whole life and I am ready to be in the majority come November. Um, but, but the reality is, and we will make that happen, but the reality is there is so much more that we can do here. If we coordinate our inside and outside organizing strategy, if we think about how we organize within Congress, you think about the Progressive Caucus as a, just as an example, that is a vote block. If you could get that vote block to really vote together and leverage that power of that 78 members or more, you could actually drive the mainstream narrative of the Democratic platform. And so that is what I'm interested in doing here, is thinking about how to use elected office for organizing. And then secondly, thinking about how to start to bridge the gap, a gap that you all are bridging as well with the work that you're doing, around what it means to have a democracy. We are talking about these critical issues of who controls democracy. There's an ideal out there that democracy is by, of, and for the people, but there are a lot of people today who do not believe that. And what has happened is that they have 
they've split off. They've said, this isn't democracy. I don't need to vote. My vote doesn't count. I don't believe that it's going to count anyway. So our job, wherever we sit, on the outside or on the inside, is to restore the trust that has to be there for democracy to work, to restore the idea that every individual really can make a difference and that their vote counts and that we are more powerful than all the money in politics and that, yes, we are different as people with rights, not as corporations defined as people but aren't people, right? So this is the work that we have to do is really try to connect government to people. And so that has been a joy every day. I've held 15 town halls in my district um, and it's been amazing. We've had 15,000 people participate in my town halls. My district gets more email, mail, and letters than any district in the country, 320,000 of those, partly because people know that I wanna hear from them. And so that's, um, that's the, you know, the core of the work. And I was proud in Washington State to help work with Move to Amend when I was in the State Senate, to help get a letter from the majority of, actually all of our Democrats, and I think we tried to get one Republican, I think Mark Melosha might have been our one Republican on that letter, to support the legislation. Um, and we in Washington State are proud of the fact that thanks to you and your work, the initiative passed with 64% of the vote. That is, I think, a remarkable achievement. And so I think that, you know, what I think we can do here in Congress is really figuring out how we continue to organize and resist. We are an opposition party, and so we are a minority party. We have to be an opposition party, and we do have to resist a lot of things. But I also think we can't just be an opposition party. We also have to be a proposition party. We have to propose the vision of the country that we believe in, and we have to call people into that. And that's why, for me, introducing bills like College for All that says that young people should not be graduating with $80,000 in debt, we should be able to go to college for free. And actually, that can be paid for by a small financial transactions tax. You know, that is one piece. We should have a government-funded health care system. We should be able to... And we should be able to fundamentally change the way our democracy works and our, uh, and our elections work so that we publicly finance elections, so that we get money so that we get money out of politics and so that we make it very clear that corporations are not people. That is core to who we are as a democracy. It doesn't work otherwise. The democracy does not function otherwise. And so that's why in my campaign, it was a $7 million race. It was ridiculous. $7 million race. One of the, high, one of the most expensive non-swing district races in the country. And um, I raised it, I said I was not gonna take any corporate PAC contributions. I raised it from people across the country. We had 82,000 individual donors and the average contribution was $23 a person, so we beat Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and, uh, and it was amazing because that's who we should be responsive to. So I am uh, incredibly, incredibly excited about the work that you're doing. I am a proud co-sponsor of the We the People Amendment, Joint House Resolution 48. Um, I took the pledge to amend when I ran for office, and I really don't buy any of the arguments for why we shouldn't amend the Constitution. I just don't think they're real. I really don't. Um, The Constitution is, and it has to be, a living document. And we do have to be careful of the people who want to amend the Constitution backwards. And there are lots of them out there. This is a really consequential moment in our country's history. I sit on the Judiciary Committee and I'm vice ranking member of the Budget Committee. And every single day on those committees, I hear what they want to do to this country. It is not what the people in the room want to do. but. 
we have an opportunity to amend the Constitution in a way that actually strengthens our democracy and puts into reality the founding values and ideals that our founders had. Because the framers got a lot of things right, but frankly, from a human rights perspective and as a woman of color, there was a lot that was wrong. And it has... And it has taken brave, courageous activists throughout the course of our history, people whose shoulders I stand on, the work of people like Sojourner Truth, the work of people like Representative John Lewis, who I get to serve next to now and who is an incredible inspiration. Um, and I got to go on the civil rights pilgrimage with him to, uh, to Montgomery and Alabama and Birmingham this, this year. It was incredible. But the reality is without amendments to our Constitution, Women would not have the right to vote. Presidents would not have term limits. We would not have equal protection and due process. We have fundamentally changed the unjust aspects of our Constitution before, and we can do it again. So we cannot afford, literally afford, in the sense of what do we hand down to our children, our grandchildren, what is the future for our democracy? We cannot afford to have a government that is ruled by the 1%. We can't have elected leaders who are beholden to the Koch brothers and to corporations, and we cannot have a Supreme Court that chooses corporations over the rights of the people. That is what our work is for. So, um, I mentioned public financing, and we, uh, we did pass a great initiative called Democracy Vouchers in Seattle, and we are now, Ro Khanna is getting ready to introduce a bill that makes that a federal, uh, federal law. So we're working on a lot of these pieces. And when I get um, down, down and, down and, uh, what's the word, down in the dumps, yeah, down in the dumps. I was gonna say something worse, but I'll say dumps. Um, down in the dumps. I think about what gives me strength as an organizer because I think what everybody in this room knows is that in organizing, strength comes from times of crisis. We are certainly in a time of crisis and it is calling upon us to act in different ways, to think in different ways, to build different coalitions, to be hopeful even when hope does not seem possible. Because ultimately, courage is not something that comes when it's easy. Courage is something that comes when things are so difficult that you have to dig deeper and you find places in you that you didn't know existed. And that is what I sometimes feel like today. But the reality is, when you look around the country at what has happened since this last election, and over time, as this democracy has skewed more and more and more towards corporations and towards the wealthiest and away from working people, what you see is people rising up. You see the women's marches. You see the defeat of Trump Care three, four times. You see women running and winning, women of color across the country, transgender, LGBT folks running in places that nobody ever thought that they could win. And you see people turning out because they have a new and renewed hope that there is something that they can do, not only something that they can do, something they must do, a responsibility for our future generations. So this is hopeful to me. It is a hopeful time to me because in the end, remember that this is fertile ground for sowing those seeds of resistance, tilling the soil, making sure that we are continuing to water those plants and those seeds and ultimately having what is a blooming democracy. Not a dead one, but an alive, blooming, and absolutely critically for the people and the human rights of all of us democracy. That's what you're doing. And I want to give you my deepest, sincerest thanks and say how proud I am to be here speaking to you, how proud I am to say that we have this kind of a movement, the move to amend movement across this country that has been planted, that is being watered, and that is going to bloom to allow us to build the democracy we know we must be. Thank you all so much.
people in charge are saying she has five minutes to answer maybe two questions. All right, so I'm gonna run it over and I'm gonna give you this one. And you got it, okay. She's an organizer, she can handle a mic. Okay, all right. Not a, qu <laughs> Not a question, but a comment, a correction. You're wrong. You are an architect. You are an engineer. You're trying to bring about social change, engineering social change, nonviolent social change, above ground, architect, below ground, that's infrastructure. You are an engineer. <laughs> All right. You get the question. All right, so if there's a constitutional convention called to amend, what are the chances that that's going to be hijacked to get some of these other untoward revisions? Well, here's the, here's the thing I was just talking to Danielle about. I think our legislation has to be very clear on what we are trying to do because this is actually a plan of the Koch brothers to call a constitutional amendment. Um, there is a great book out that I can't remember the name of right this moment, but I met with the author um, at Rosa DeLora's house a couple of weeks ago, and she has done all this research over how the Koch brothers have been putting in place a plan for the last 10 years. Democracy in Chains, that's it, thank you. And that they have 28 states already ready to go for a constitutional convention. And that the plan is to get rid of the Bill of Rights and to do a whole bunch of other things that we wouldn't want, which is part of the reason I mentioned that today. So I do think we have to be very, very, very careful about what we call for and how we call for it. We do not want to play into um, the idea that we need a constitutional convention that would ultimately allow them to, be, to hijack it. Uh, we have to think about how we actually make the kinds of changes that we want within our system until we get them out of the way. So I'm very worried about it. They only need six more states, um, and they are doing everything they can to win those state legislatures. This has been good for us. We have taken over more state seats, legislative seats across the country in the last 15 months than we have in a very long time. So actually, it's been good for strengthening our state legislatures, but I'm, I'm deeply worried about it. And if you've read Democracy in Chains, you know it's a, it's a real thing that has had a lot of money behind it. Thank you. Okay, so we have a session on the convention, so we can talk about that more there. And I wanna stay in uh, that woman's good graces. So we're gonna let the Congresswoman go. Let's please give her another round of applause. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi. Okay, so normally we'd have like a break moment after something like that, but we had to just sneak her in on the agenda. So we're actually going to totally shift gears to something else now. Um, but I think that a lot of what she said actually is very helpful to us as we're thinking about uh, being strategic and organizing and what we're doing. So um, give me a second here. To, let's like take two minutes. We're going to end the live stream. We shouldn't be live streaming at this point because it won't be useful for them. So thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow if you're online. Um, and I need George and Tara and... Daniel to join me because what we're going to talk about now is money and move to amend sustainability.